When you picture Adolf Hitler's bunker, do you picture damp, moldy floral carpets? The maddening hum of a ventilator room buzzing 24-7, driving the Third Reich top brass to the brink of madness? Or the portrait of a long-dead Prussian king that Hitler himself spent hours obsessively staring at as the Red Army closed in? And believe us when we tell you, that is barely scratching the surface of the madness behind the reinforced metal doors, once guarded by two heavily armed SS guards, descending into the cold darkness of the earth. Welcome to the infamous Führer Bunker, and get ready to hear the tale of the insane part it played in the closing days of the 20th century's bloodiest war. But before we make like a gang of angry Soviet soldiers and bust down the doors, let's rewind the clock a bit and find out how this legendary location of evil was first created. The Führer Bunker was constructed in Berlin near the Reich Chancellery in 1936 and finished in 1944, though it wouldn't see any use until January 16, 1945, when Hitler took up residence. From then until the end of the war, the Führer Bunker was the nerve center of the Nazi regime. It was the final Führer Hauptquartier, or Führer Headquarters, that Hitler used during the course of the war, and it's become known worldwide as the place where Hitler finally gave in. But would you believe it was only actually in use for three months? When Hitler first assumed power in 1933, he inherited an office on Wilhelmstrasse, the street in the center of Berlin where a number of German government buildings were located until 1945. That was also the location of the Reich Chancellery, formerly a city palace that had been built for Antony Radziwill, a Polish-Prussian prince who had married the niece of the Prussian king Frederick the Great. Remember that name, folks, it will come up again. Even though the chancellery was to be Hitler's new official address, its size and its decorations weren't to the fascist leader's liking. He even described the decor as being more fit for a soap company than the office of the chancellor. Weirdly specific, Adolf, but okay. The Nazi bigwig wanted his new abode to reflect the power and grandeur of the German Reich that he had envisioned. But until it could be remodeled and made bigger, it was deemed to be completely inadequate for the Führer's needs. Seems like he might have been compensating for something. Some work on expanding the chancellery began in 1936, which was when the first part of Hitler's bunker complex was added, called the Vorbunker, meaning either the upper bunker or the forward bunker. It contained all the basic amenities one would need while living underground and plotting to take over the world. These included a generator room, complete with ventilators, a shower and accompanying washroom, dormitory, and toilet facilities, all branching off from a linear corridor that took you through a central dining room. Fancy. The Vorbunker's concrete roof was just over five feet thick. It had actually been built in part to support the weight of a new reception hall and a ballroom that had been added to the Reich Chancellery overhead. There were two main entrances to get inside, the first being located in the Foreign Ministry Garden, the other leading into the Vorbunker from a new building that was about to be built. You see, in 1938, construction got underway on a much bigger building at Hitler's behest, the new Reich Chancellery, over on Volstrasse, the adjacent street to the existing original Chancellery building. But more on that in a moment, what else was hiding down in the Vorbunker? Both its entrances led to reinforced steel doors that were sealed tight enough to prevent gas from leaking in. Beyond were a small set of rooms, on the left a boiler and water supplies room, with an air filters room on the right. Further down was the aforementioned central dining room, with a dedicated kitchen to the right. Here Hitler's own personal cook and dietitian, Frau Constanza Manziarli, would prepare meals for the Führer and his staff, insert obligatory mention of Hitler being a vegetarian here. As if having your own dedicated chef on hand to cook for you wasn't opulent enough, the Vorbunker also came equipped with a well-stocked wine store, just in case old Addy felt like a soothing glass of vino after the day's crimes against humanity. Further into the Vorbunker, there were dedicated quarters for personnel, including guards, as well as a conference room. On the left of this were two additional rooms that initially housed Hitler's personal physician, Dr. Theodore Morell. However, for reasons we'll get into later, Morell was dismissed in April 1945 and turfed out from his spot in the Vorbunker to make room for someone else. Think of it like an episode of The Bachelor, but with more fascism. To the right of the conference room was another room used as guest quarters, a pair of storerooms, and later a stairwell leading, well, somewhere else entirely. All we'll say for now is it led just over eight feet lower underground, and there was a steel door at the bottom of that stairwell, guarded at all times by members of the SS. 
Back on the surface, the new Reich Chancellery was being designed by Albert Speer, a man referred to as the first architect of the Third Reich, who would later go on to become Hitler's Minister of Armaments. Hitler's grand plans expanded far beyond conquering all of Germany, or even all of Europe. He was set on the idea of global fascist domination, and alongside Speer, the Fuhrer sought to transform the city of Berlin into the capital of the entire world that he called Germania. He was really taking go big or go home to its logical extremes. Hitler insisted on having grand, monumental design, and Speer applied this principle when overseeing the construction of the new Reich Chancellery. The building would contain a huge court of honor, the Ehrenhof, where visiting diplomats and dignitaries from around the world would be greeted by statues that were made by sculptor Arno Brecker. These were named the Wehrmacht and Partei, or the Armed Forces and the Party. The new Reich Chancellery would also come complete with double doors that measured 17 feet tall and opened out into a gallery 145 meters or 480 feet in length. That is twice the length of the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. And of course, the building would not be complete without a room for the Führer himself, namely a cavernous office filled with a floor space of 400 meters squared, in order to remind any who set foot inside that they were standing in the presence of one of the most powerful dictators on the planet. But here's the rub. Something happened a year after the work on the new Reich Chancellery began that completely changed everything. A little something called the start of World War II. What an incredible plot twist, who could have seen that coming? After war broke out in 1939, Hitler started spending increasingly less time in Berlin, meaning his need for the new Reich Chancellery was no longer as pressing. After all, the Führer had a war effort to oversee, and as a result he spent more of his time at military command posts, for example his Eastern Front headquarters, the Wolfschanze or Wolf's Lair, and the Kielstein House, the Eagle's Nest, his holiday home built at the summit of the Kielstein Mountain. Of course, Berlin wasn't going anywhere while Hitler was jetting off to coordinate the Nazis' war efforts. But while he was away from the city, the German capital was on the receiving end of numerous attacks by the Allied forces. Between 1940 and 1945, a combination of the United States Air Force, Britain's Royal Air Force, and the Soviet Union's bombers conducted well over 350 airstrikes over Berlin. The Nazis weren't the only ones sending planes to hit their enemies where they lived. Over the course of the bombing campaign, tens of thousands of German civilians lost their lives. In addition, the explosions caused significant damage to countless buildings, apartments, to military installations, and even government offices were targeted and obliterated. Thanks to these air raids conducted against the Nazi capital, this called for the construction of a permanent air raid shelter for the Führer and high-ranking members of Nazi leadership. There was still, of course, the Vorbunker, which had been completed several years prior, back in 1936. But with British, American, and Soviet bombs raining over Berlin, plans were quickly drawn up to build further bunkers beneath the gardens of both the original Reich Chancellery building and the new Reich Chancellery. Work on the newest of these bunkers was completed in 1944, and Hitler's new subterranean lair would become known as the Führer Bunker, the shelter for the leader. It was added beneath the gardens of the First Reich Chancellery by the Hochtief Construction Company under the supervision of Hitler's old pal Albert Speer. Little did those working on it know that they were creating the place where Adolf Hitler would spend the final moments of his life. Under Berlin, in a damp, meagerly furnished concrete hiding place, the fascist Führer would oversee the final days of his crumbling Third Reich, marry his mistress, Eva Braun, and inevitably and only one day later bite the big one. The Führer bunker was located beneath the gardens of the old Reich's chancellery and cost a whopping total of 1.4 million Reichsmarks. The Führer bunker served as the command center for what still remained of the Third Reich's leaders. It also offered private chambers for Hitler himself, his soon-to-be wife Eva Braun, and other highly ranked Nazi officers. It was slightly smaller than the earlier Vorbunker, but it still came equipped with just the essentials that Hitler and his inner circle would need. The Führer bunker contained multiple briefing rooms, a telephone exchange, a machine room, and several bedrooms that all had been furnished with items that were removed from the old Reich Chancellery building above. In total, there were around 30 rooms. The bunker itself was located 8.5 meters beneath the ground above and had a concrete roof that was just over 3 meters in thickness. It was situated deep enough underground to withstand the explosions caused by the largest of the British and American bombs that were being dropped on Berlin. 
Part of what made the Führer bunker just one in a large underground complex of bunkers was that there were as many as 20 additional bunkers and air raid shelters used by Hitler's inner circle, his bodyguards, and military commanders that were all within the vicinity of the old Reich Chancellery. The cellars of the other surrounding buildings were also converted into auxiliary bunkers during the Battle of Berlin. The Führer bunker was also connected directly to the Vorbunker. Remember that stairway we told you about earlier? Remaining guarded at all times, this was what led from the Vorbunker down to the Führer bunker. By passing down the staircase, visitors would be met with SS sentries who checked identity papers before permitting entry. Once the door was opened, it would lead into the Führer bunker's main hall and lounge area. That same door between the two bunkers could also be sealed off by a system of heavy steel bulkheads. So should the Allied forces ever storm Berlin and seize control over the Nazi capital, Hitler could lock himself away in his bunker and prevent his enemy's troops from getting in while also keeping himself from ever getting out. The Führer bunker itself was divided into a long central corridor that gave way to an emergency exit staircase at the far end leading up to another part of the old Reich Chancellery's garden up on the surface. That central corridor was further divided up into two long rooms, the first being the lounge. Heading through a door on the left would take someone to the bathrooms, an essential in any underground bunker, and an electricity switch room. From the restrooms, a connecting door led to the bathroom and a dressing room. When she later took up her own short-lived residence in the Führer bunker, Eva Braun's bedroom would be situated on the right of the bathroom. Another door connected to the bathroom was Hitler's sitting room, and on the right of this was the Führer's study. This room was dominated by a large portrait of King Frederick the Great. You see, we told you he'd come up again. You better not have forgotten. Supposedly, when the Soviet army would later fight its way into Berlin through the suburbs, Hitler would spend a lot of his time staring at the portrait of the Prussian king hoping that he could emulate Frederick the Great and push back the Soviets with one big, grandiose display of military strength. Heading back to the sitting room, there was a door connecting this to Hitler's own private bedroom. Another door to the right of the study led back into a section of the Führer bunker's central corridor that served as a conference room. The remaining rooms weren't connected to the various parts of Hitler's suite. These were the map room, where the Führer held military situation conferences in the final weeks of the war, a cloak room, and the ventilation room. Now, you gotta keep the last one of those in your mind. The ventilation and generator room was connected to the telephone switchboard room, where officers of the SS worked. The last two rooms on the right of the central conference room were the doctor's quarters and a bedroom reserved for one of Hitler's closest allies, but more on him in a moment. Now, a concrete room, even one underground, is bound to get a little chilly. Luckily, the Führer bunker had something to help with this, carpets. Yeah, that's right, parts of both of the Vorbunker and the Führer bunker were carpeted. A scrap of the material used was even recovered in a British regimental archive after the war. It was a floral pattern with yellow flowers and blue leaves over a fawn background. There were also several oil paintings up on the walls taken from the old Reich Chancellery, as was most of the furniture. We're sure that did a lot to really bring those murky underground rooms together and really brighten up the doom and gloom for the Nazis hiding out at the tail end of the war. In early 1945, Hitler and a number of his senior officers would return to Berlin after coordinating the Nazis' failing war efforts over on the Eastern Front. By this point, the Russian army had advanced across Poland and were continuing to push toward the eastern part of Germany. Meanwhile, those bombing raids carried out by the Allied forces had left Berlin devastated. The Nazis' army was failing its offensive on the Western Front, so a disgruntled Hitler decided to return to Berlin and consider his next move. On January 16, 1945, he boarded his private train, the Führer Zonterzug, literally the Führer's special train, and headed back to the capital. As he made his journey back through the capital, Hitler reportedly looked out at the ruins of the buildings that had been destroyed or heavily damaged by the Allies' air raids. This was the first time he'd returned to Berlin in a while, and some even claim that witnessing the grim sight of the city in ruins not only depressed the Führer, but also surprised him. From the window of his carriage, he was seeing firsthand the evidence of his military failure. At 9.30 that morning, the Führer Sonderjug pulled into the Grunewald station, and Hitler departed his personal train for what would be the very last time. He was then escorted by a convoy of armored Mercedes cars to the old Reich Chancellery building, passing streets that had been destroyed by the Allies' retaliation against the Nazis. 
Apartment buildings damaged by bombs were left without their roofs, many collapsing as if to foreshadow the impending collapse of the Third Reich itself. Two days later, a massive offensive was launched by the Soviet Union. By the end of January, they were only 70 miles away from Berlin. The walls were quite literally closing in on Hitler. At this time, he was still staying in the official apartments that were located inside the older Reich Chancellery. It wasn't until the middle of February that he moved into the Führer bunker. He did see the outside of his underground lair before the end of the war, as he would take meals over in the new Reich Chancellery and held conferences in his study there, where he was informed of the current military situation on the eastern and western fronts. Despite the Allies' bombing campaigns against Berlin, the grand hallways Hitler and Albert Speer had designed remained mostly intact. Although a lot of the priceless artwork and tapestries once displayed in the new Reich Chancellery had been moved to protect them from damage. During his brief time coming to and from the Führer bunker to both the old Reich Chancellery and the new Reich Chancellery, Hitler mainly kept to his study, as well as a select few other rooms in both chancelleries. But what he didn't see was the true extent of the damage that had been done to both buildings. Staff and officers who arrived for meetings with the Führer were forced to take elaborate routes through the chancelleries in order to reach the study. This was due to the British and American aerial bombings that had caused a number of the corridors inside to collapse, direct hits from bombs leaving little more than rubble, which was now blocking the route of those Hitler was meeting with. Soon after, the advancing Red Army began launching rockets and barrages of artillery fire as they made their way closer and closer to Berlin. A lot of this caused additional damage to the original chancellery, further threatening its structural integrity. The Soviets would turn the once immaculate buildings into ruins, as portions of roofs and walls would collapse when hit with artillery shells and rockets, leaving the structures scarred from shells and shrapnel, scorched by flames from explosions, and without their windows after the blast shattered the glass. The constant barrage of air raids and the Soviet Army's encroaching attacks caused Hitler to decide to permanently relocate his headquarters to the relative safety of the Führer bunker. In March 1945, he and his inner circle headed beneath the old Reich Chancellery and took up more permanent residence in the bunker below. A month later in April, they would be joined by Eva Braun, Hitler's mistress, and Joseph Goebbels. In case you didn't know who that guy was, Goebbels was considered by many to be Hitler's closest confidant, a dark wizard of media manipulation. He was one of the fascist leader's closest and most devoted followers, a true believer, serving the Nazis as the district leader of Berlin and the party's chief propagandist. Goebbels was also an advocate for harsh discrimination policies, including the extermination of the Jewish people during the Holocaust. Joseph Goebbels took the other bedroom to the right of the Führerbunker's conference room. His wife, Magda Goebbels, along with their young children also moved into the bunker complex when Goebbels did, except they took up residence over in the Vorbunker. Hey, remember before when we told you that Hitler kicked his own doctor out of his dedicated room in the Vorbunker? Well, this is why. It was to make room for Magda and the Goebbels' children, all six of them. Although, while hiding underground, the remaining Nazi leadership was safe from aerial attacks and aerial bombardment, it quickly became apparent that the cramped conditions down in the Führer bunker made it inadequate as a military headquarters. There wasn't enough space to accommodate Hitler's military staff or any visiting generals there to attend conferences. Many of those who visited it during the final weeks of the Second World War considered it to be little more than a squalid hole in the ground. A concrete coffin, as some put it. Turns out, they'd be right on the money with that description. Another big drawback of living in the Führer bunker was the constant noise. Remember that ventilation room we mentioned? Well, it was full of aeration ventilators, and these had to be kept running for 24 hours a day, and they were loud, especially in a confined underground space. Also, thanks to the high level of groundwater in Berlin, the bunker had another continuous problem, moisture seeping into the walls. On April 16, 1945, the Soviet army was mobilizing its troops and encircling the city of Berlin. They launched an assault on Silo Heights, one of the last remaining lines of defense to the east of the city. After days of fighting despite suffering significant casualties, by the 19th the Soviet soldiers had broken through. Now there was nothing standing between them and the Nazi capital. The following day would be Adolf Hitler's very last public appearance. He ventured up to the surface on his 56th birthday to award the Iron Cross to young boys who had been recruited into the Hitler Youth and had fought the Soviet soldiers in East Prussia. Hitler and a number of other high-ranking officers who'd been sharing the Führer bunker with him met the Hitler Youth in the garden of the old Reich Chancellery. That very same day, 
The Soviets' artillery strikes came within range of the old Reich Chancellery, reaching the Berlin suburbs and opening fire. By the next evening, there were T-34 tanks on the outskirts of Berlin. On the city streets, Russian soldiers fought savagely against Nazi troops over control of the German capital. It was becoming evident that the Allied forces were about to win the war in Europe. The wavering Nazi defense of Berlin against the arriving Soviet forces was conducted by General Helmut Weidling. The few troops left at his disposal consisted of several Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS divisions that were depleted and disorganized, worn down from fighting the Soviets since January. 1,000 Volkstrom, who were mostly older men above military age and young volunteers from the Hitler Youth, were also called upon to support the regular Nazi troops, but these reserves were poorly trained and unprepared for combat against the Red Army. They were outnumbered by the Soviet soldiers 10 to 1. Enemy troops were closing in around Berlin, and the Nazis focused their efforts on protecting the Reich Chancellery and the Führer bunker below. It seemed clear that the defense of Berlin was not going to last long. On the 30th of April, Weidling met with Hitler and told him the news. The Soviet army had nearly reached the gates of the Reich Chancellery. He also brought word of the execution of Benito Mussolini, Italy's own fascist dictator and one of Hitler's allies as part of the Axis powers. Mussolini died on April 28, 1945, after being strung up by his heels and then thrown into the gutter. Still, Hitler scrabbled for anything he could that might turn the tide. At one point, it was thought that there might be some vulnerability in one of the Soviet flanks and issued orders for an SS counterattack. He still refused to accept the reality that what was left of his forces was severely depleted and weren't going to be able to hold the city. They simply couldn't go ahead with the counterattack. When Hitler learned of this during a conference in the Führer bunker, he had a complete mental breakdown, forever immortalized in that one scene from the movie Downfall that used to be a huge meme. After he had stopped screaming, he declared to his shocked officers that they had lost the war. It seems that this was what finally made Hitler come to terms with reality. There was only one way to escape being captured and being made to face public humiliation. It was the final week of April 1945. In the months since he'd returned to Berlin, Hitler had become confined to a collection of drab, gray concrete rooms deep underneath the old Reich Chancellery. Meanwhile, above his head, Soviet troops had managed to reach the city center and were now fighting only a short distance from the Chancellery and the Führer bunker. By this point, the Soviets had Berlin completely surrounded. The sounds of shell fire could clearly be heard from inside the Führer bunker, even over the constant noise of the ventilators. Between April 28th and 29th, Hitler dictated his will to one of his two secretaries in the form of a personal and political testament. Then, shortly after, the Führer married Eva Braun. According to accounts from some of the secretaries that were present, namely Hitler's private secretary, Martin Bormann, his personal secretary, Gerda Christian, and Gertrude Junge, the staff inside the Führer bunker were all called to come and witness the newly married couple. Both Hitler and Braun emerged from the map room, which was where their wedding ceremony had been conducted. Very romantic, getting married in a room where Adolf Hitler held military situation conferences. Alongside the Nazi newlyweds were Joseph and Magda Goebbels, and Eva pointed to her wedding ring, receiving congratulations from those gathered around the Fuhrer bunker. Shortly after, a party was held to mark the occasion. Gerda Christian's account of the events stated that Hitler seemed to be mostly talking about the past and thinking of happier times. However, he still admitted that he was well aware the war had been lost, although he claimed he would never allow the Russian soldiers to take him prisoner. He also told Junge that his wedding had been an emotional experience, but that going out on his own terms would be Hitler's way of redeeming what he felt had been a very difficult life. Personally, we find it hard to sympathize with a fascist dictator who was responsible for the slaughter of millions. In all likelihood, Hitler was aware that if he was taken alive by the Soviet army, he'd be forced to stand trial for the atrocities he committed, or given the Mussolini special, and end up hanging from a streetlight after a few hours of Soviet torture. After the ceremony and the subsequent party, Gerda Christian was invited to join the couple for a wedding breakfast. While she was accustomed to joining Hitler and Braun for meals, she ended up leaving early, overwhelmed by the gloomy, dour atmosphere. As it turned out, there wouldn't be much time for a romantic honeymoon. What with the Soviet artillery shells destroying the Chancellery Gardens above their head and all. Later that day, Hitler, his secretaries, and his personal cook all had lunch together. The Führer and his wife then made their farewells to the rest of the Nazi leaders and military officers who'd been in the bunker with them. The couple's personal staff were assembled, 
and the pair went around the room shaking hands with everyone in silence. It was very clear what was about to happen. The two then entered Hitler's study, never to be seen alive again. With the nightmarish newlyweds dead, their bodies were taken to the surface and placed next to each other on the ground in the Chancellery Gardens, just outside the entrance to the Führer bunker. A small group gathered around the corpses, including Goebbels and Martin Bormann, as Hitler and Braun were set on fire using a gasoline-soaked rag. The group made the Nazi salute over the bodies before retreating back to the Führer bunker as the sound of the Soviets' artillery approached. Strangely, the bodies of both Hitler and his wife weren't entirely destroyed by the fire. The Russian artillery left them buried in a shallow bomb crater, although their remains were later exhumed in Magdeburg in East Germany by Soviet troops. According to Russian reports, Hitler's body was said to have been finally destroyed by the KGB in April of 1970. The only parts that remain are two fragments of his jawbone and his skull that have been preserved and were displayed in an exhibition at the Russian Federal Archives in Moscow three decades later in April 2000. During the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, the Soviets falsely announced that Hitler's remains were still yet to be found, sparking rumors that the vile dictator was still alive. Announced in June 1945, this naturally led to a slew of suspected sightings of Hitler and Braun across Europe, meaning the Allied forces had to determine for certain that Hitler had perished in his bunker. They interrogated a number of his staff who'd been by Hitler's side, focusing on the events that took place in the Führer bunker in April 1945. Joseph Stalin ordered the Soviet army to completely destroy the two chancellery buildings, with both the old and new Reich chancelleries being demolished between 1945 and 1949. The Soviet troops would also make numerous attempts to blow up the Führer bunker and the Vord bunker below, and by the 80s the area had been flattened ready to make way for residential apartments. When excavations took place in order to lay the foundations of these apartments, the surviving sections of both bunkers were uncovered. Construction crews discovered that parts of the Führer bunker had survived, albeit mostly flooded thanks to that Berlin groundwater getting through the interior walls. The Vor bunker was better preserved, its ventilation pipes were even still in place. Most of the walls inside still had their tiles, with a number of metal safes still securely standing upright although decaying thanks to rust. Several areas of the two bunkers were demolished by construction crews, with the remainder being filled in and sealed off forever. All that remains today on site is an information board that was placed there in 2006. It describes the dimensions of both bunkers and a timeline, otherwise it's now just an innocuous parking lot. Nearby stands the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe, paying tribute to those who tragically and needlessly lost their lives due to Hitler's regime. Now watch Hitler's plans for the USA if he won, or watch this instead.